now that we have this character sheet, I want to go over the considerations that have been or that will be needed for us to now design a campaign around the characters that we have. And you all in chat here have given some excellent suggestions so far that hopefully you'll see that I was on the same wavelength too when I was doing the the pre-show um, the pre-show prep. And especially coming off of the threats that are to the party, be prepared for a few different endings to the campaign, depending on the choices they make. This is not going to be an easily railroaded party. I imagine if you have players who have characters like this, they're going to be a little bit more wise. They'll have gone through a couple of murder mysteries before, some politicking, different combats. It may be different form if we have naval combat or underwater combat, uh, combat which is good because you want to provide a challenge to your players. You want to take the person with the longest uh, the longest beard at the, at the table and be able to, to have them go, whoa, that was neat. I really enjoyed that. So note, running this as a D&D game will take more development of the region than we have initially provided. It doesn't have to be a 300-page hardcover splat book. We should develop the names and areas more, and we'll have to make presumptions and, lo and logic jumps as we are, uh, as we're going. Like we're talking about thieves guild, right? We didn't necessarily. Actually, one might have said that there's a, a thieves guild. Uh, there's something with a thieves guild going on. I think there was a calamity. Oh yeah. So okay, here we go. I'm sorry. So all right, we did provide for it with, with a, a sentence. And that's fine. That's all we need in order to uh, to have this come in. But we can look over our region that we've designed and pull inspiration from it, too. And we want to cross-reference the map and we want to think about this. But do we have the name of the leader or what type of government they are? No. And I think what we'll do over the next couple weeks is actually fill out this region that we've made. And so maybe we'll, actually, we'll make Kandor. Um, or whatever. I'll roll a d6 to randomize it. Uh, I don't know yet. That'll be for Tuesday, because remember, this is this week's last broadcast. Um, you know, but let's say we start with Candor. So now we'll just focus on Candor and bring a lot more detail to it. We can make the map of Candor itself, not just the region that it's in. Who here is the longest beard? Uh, well, I have been uh, I've been playing D and D since two thousand. Although I think uh, if Bubonic's in here. I think Bubonic beats me, and I think that Shadzar probably uh, has the longest beard of all of us that are in here. Because Ro just started growing his beard. Dark Wolf just started growing her beard. Um, I think Bobicus has been playing for a while. All right, so with this presumption that we have going on, how do we naturally bond characters that are seemingly so different? Neutral, lawful evil, neutral, chaotic neutral, neutral evil. Well, a consideration we should take as DMs, I don't think this party should be starting at level one. They aren't initially friends like the party last week was in TNEs. And it uh, seems to imply that they've been doing what they've been doing for a while now. How do you have a social butterfly if she's never been outside the, you know, the palace before? Um, you know, uh, how do we have um, a monk who is also a hired killer in this setting? If he, if, if this is his first kill, then I, th I don't know. That seems a little awkward. I was thinking that we'd probably start this party around level five. Um, that way, everyone's everyone has even been allowed to get a little bit into their uh, into their archetype five or six, something like that. And the the what we're planning should go for uh, I don't know at least six levels, maybe even ten. Meaning that if we left out the last four levels, that would be well, we've gone together and we've sewn up as much as we can. And the last four levels could be maybe doing something about the big bad evil guy, or actually that last push to put down the. Uh, to put down the force that is uh, external, but we, we can't do that until we get a lot of our higher powers. Bobica says off and on. Roe continues uh, his synopsis. Gilliam Bates was hailed 
as the inventor of the steam engine and was the largest producer of said engines. Mr. Bates proposed a contract that would have us go to one of his factories in Tarrant and, and retrieve a schematic of a new steam engine. Catch is it was in an area of the city known as the Condemned District. Oh. So it sounds like you might have to have a, a dungeon crawl through an abandoned factory or something. Dark Wolf says, I'll be a beautiful dwarven matron one day. That's true. Keep talking about D&D, &D, playing it, enjoying it, and you'll have a full, luxurious wizard's beard of your own. <laughs> So, possibilities. If we're starting, if we're starting off, and uh, there are some here that I can input um, that, uh, from, that were brought up during the break. Uh, if we have an in-media res, that means that everyone, uh, that we would think of a combat, an initial combat for our level 5. We'll just say le our level 5 characters. We make a map out, and we say, you all are back-to-back, -back and I'm attacking you with monsters. And you put the pressure on. Now do the players don't the players don't know what's going on, but presumably their characters have an inkling of how they got there and what's happening. And this is kind of forcing that initial combat, um, and it's it's getting them to fight, maybe not for each other, but at least with each other. And there's an instant burst of action. And everyone can play with their new characters, and you as the DM can also use that as a chance to evaluate how well they can fight. Are they, you know, are they blowing through their spells? Is, is the combat too hard? Is there such a glaring weakness that, pardon me, <clears throat> is there such a glaring weakness that even this first combat is overwhelming them? It's a good way to get everyone's feet wet. We can also have them in a contained environment. Uh, so in this case, I proposed maybe they're aboard Lily Wellen's Gamble. And that is the ship that our sorcerer it was a part of, is no longer, but is endeared to. And while they're aboard there, um, it's a little hard, you know, if you're in the middle of the sea, to, you know, just leave because someone, you know, said something. And you also need to watch out because, let's say that our monk uh, decided, for whatever reason, to just randomly kill someone. I don't think that would be in that character's um, idiom to do so. But if he just did, then he'd just get thrown overboard and he'll drown. So there is kind of an imposed border of responsibility and way that you have to conduct yourself. And we can even have an attack. Uh, this could lead into what was talked about, I think King was talking about having, um, yeah, some pirating attempts or a shakedown of a local noble might send out a, a government boat and the boat stops them and there's a shakedown trying to be had and it turns into a scuffle. Now in both these cases we have just a no knowledge attack, right? This is we're going for pure adrenaline, and we want to we want to put them under duress, and we want to we want to stress test the party right out the gate. The other one allows for maybe a little uh, social interaction, uh, as at least one of the characters I can see going around and trying to find her prospects, um, her next prospects. And then we have an attack, and then it's all hands on deck, right? We need everyone up here because we're taking cannon fire, or there's a raiding party, something along those lines. Oh. What do we have? Oh, <laughs> yep, that's true. So this is um, King. Uh, it's because we're talking about uh, earning your beard here by playing D and D for a while, and so King provided this that Dark Wolf, uh, after playing D and D for years, will be a uh, magnificent dwarven woman. Now, bear in mind when you see something like this, uh, dwarven women traditionally did have beards too. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the easiest thing to be able to uh, tell them apart, at least not initially. Though, with whatever, if you want to call them modern sensibilities or aesthetics or something along those lines, that wasn't, um, that wasn't necessarily uh, something that continued. And then they kind of just turned into, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're beautiful by human convention, but we have the kind of the stereotypical, you know, they're, they're like the bigger build women, they're very busty, you know, they're strong and they'll, you know, but they, all, they also kind of look like the brow beaters or the shrews. Um, so it is always fun to see the, the references back to how dwarves were originally presented. Um, it's a good way to kind of stir things up. Roe continues, the Condemned District was a section of the city that had been quarantined due to a plague. The Tarantian army will shoot anyone trying to enter or leave the district. The contract paid 10,000 gold upon completion, 
However, the contract had to be signed in blood to ensure it wouldn't be broken. Ah, so there's probably some magics involved with that then. And you're going to have to kind of uh, do some espionage, some like Metal Gear action to, uh, in order to get in and get out without being shot. And then, of course, ooh, you're going to have to survive whatever this plague is, right? That could be... Uh, and depending on the level of uh, medical knowledge at the time, you might not know if, uh, if we talk about the bubonic plague. You know, that was, was that just an act of God? Or in this case, it was fleas that were on the rats. People might think that a rat is a dirty animal, and they may be right. But this was the fleas on the rats, even. So you're going to be going into an area that you have to be super cautious, because if you don't know what was causing this plague, then, oh boy. <laughs> but uh, but please do uh, uh, please do continue, Ro, and uh, I'd like to go from there. Uh, now, you can also, um, as a DM... You could give it to your players that X is the starting location and have them develop the reason why they're there. So you you kind of, you know, you toss them the baby and run away. So let's say that uh, they are all going to start, right? If we said there's, there's two trading posts, one kind of taxes stuff coming in, and the other one taxes stuff coming out. So maybe you tell your players, all right, here's our map, and we're starting right here where X marks the spot. I want you to think about why you are in this in this city. I, and what is an organic reason for your character to be here? And then you have those conversations with the players, and then things are, are set up and, and you start them there. And so they are in the location, and then you as the DM can set the hook a little bit more easily. Um, at least more easily than just trying to, um, you know, thread a needle. We can, uh, then we can also make the note of, uh, are they agents of this invading empire? And maybe they're not even citizens of it, right? They, they each were just recruited over time, brought to whatever infiltration base that the empire has been developing. Because something like this probably isn't just a pure act of random war where they're going to bring ships in and conquer. This has been planned. This has been scouted. Um, this this could even be one one level removed where they work for one of the thieves' guilds, and the thief guild was contracted, and we talked about that over break too. Uh, so they can even just be agents of this empire or of a gang or a thieves' guild. <laughs> Is King planning on becoming a long stash? <laughs> also, a relevant question to bring up. How do we keep them bonded initially before uh, they naturally before they naturally start growing together? Well, we need some external threat or opportunity that is greater than they are. Um, that said, with characters, especially two evil characters, the use of force against them should make those characters and maybe even the players themselves feel combative and maybe defiant. Be very careful as a DM, especially in a more advanced setting and story like what we want to tell here, about using force. About saying, um, you know, we will kill you if you don't follow these orders. Because um, not only when it comes down to the plot of, of you saying, well, if you're this powerful person and you want, if you want us to do it, but you're treating us like a bunch of local yokels, why do you trust us in the first place? And why are you committing so many resources to following us and making sure everything is done and then killing us if it's not done right? What that, that, that doesn't make sense. So the use of force with very independent characters can be a wedge that would make it difficult for them to want to bond together in a group. Though there needs to be this external threat or opportunity, and we brought up the metaphor of going bumper bowling. You want the bowling ball to hit the pins. You can set bumpers in the gutter so that the, the you're not railroading, right? You're not specifically giving a direction for this group, because that's that's very artificial. And you will find that even if it's not combative, that these characters will probably want to defy that or go elsewhere. But in this case, we're, we're allowing for this in-between wiggle room for the ball to continue advancing down the alley, and uh, it'll hit whatever pins it hits. And there's even a chance that you can still get a gutter ball if you're going bumper bowling, because the bumpers uh, traditionally only go so far. 
And if they bounce in the right angle, instead of hitting pins, they'll bounce and go into the gutter. Uh, and then we also use the metaphor of a, a pinball machine. And the party is the the party is the ball, and it wants to go around, travel around the board, you know, light things up and score points, and you get all these fun sounds and noises and animations. And the bumpers are what keep the ball going, though there's still a risk of loss if they go un, uh, if they go underneath the bumpers. And I would recommend this kind of a style of storytelling with a party like this and a campaign like this. Is we need to be bumpers. We don't need to be a track. King says my beard grows in maximum power. Babaka says there are some groups that will just follow the signs this way to adventure. But the people who created these characters are not among them. I, I would agree. Not that they're actual people, but like if there were. No, I, I think we can... If someone made a character like this at a prompt of we're running a political game, then it's weird because this then becomes its own kind of in-game metagame. <laughs> or meta in-game? I, I don't know how you'd want to pronounce it. But that's true, Bob, because I'm, I'm with you on that. So, possibilities. They can be captured. Again, though, this is a use of force. Force usually works once very well, and after that, characters tend to get very clever, defiant, or they'll just say, or as a player, they'll say, look, did you want us to be agents? Did you want us to go around? Or are you just going to capture us and throw us in jail every time that we're, we're trying to interact in your campaign? Um, when we're playing mysteries, when we're playing, you know, murder mystery, espionage, Metal Gear, that kind of stuff, um, the use of DM Fiat to force characters into something can damage the game. Sometimes it's necessary. As a DM, sometimes you have to put your foot down because a character might go off the rails and, I don't know, the monk the monk might blow up at a sailor and snap his neck and in that case, I mean, what do you what do? You, do? you can talk to the player and the player's like, well, you told us to make a character. Said, yes, but you also need an operational character. Someone who can get through the first 15 minutes of the narration without murdering someone because you have a greater goal. You've been sent to kill someone and you can't do that unless, you know, if you're in jail or thrown overboard. Now, you can also then give an invitation. Now, is it an invitation that they that they uh, shouldn't refuse? Probably. But at least there's you're giving them the opportunity to refuse it, even though they probably won't. You'll catch more flies with honey than vinegar. That's a very good expression to use. Yeah, hypothetical metagaming. That, that's a good term for it. <laughs> Only commit one crime at a time, says Bobacus, yes. <laughs> Yeah, come, come on, George. One crime at a time. This is all I'm asking is your DM. Come on, George. One crime at a time. <laughs> now, you can also offer wealth or favors that would empower them along their individual goals. Um, so, a lot of them need money for things. And so, providing money for working together is fine. And that allows them to be selfish, but that still allows them to cooperate because they're still in their alley heading towards their pins and the, in the bowling ball in the alley next to them is still going towards its pins. You know, the pins are all at the one end and that's fine. We're all going there, and though they're just in, they're taking separate routes, but that is what's binding them. <clears throat> Pardon. Roe continues, after doing research, we learned that the plague was transferred by touch and that it spreads very aggressively. Affected individual skin begin to go through necrosis and they would uh, tear blood. After a week, the infected would die. No known treatment could cure the plague. After studying the Tarantian army's defenses, we found a way in by sneaking through the sewers. I, I presume this means that not even um, curative magics could touch this uh, this disease, Romonger? Is, is that what you also discovered? Or did you discover that traditional medicines, which are probably more ubiquitous than magical ones, can't cure it? but you need kind of an obscure spell or there's no one around who can do that. I'm, I'm a little curious about how your, your DM is pulling off the plague. I, I don't say that in a doubtful way, um, but these are things that have to be considered, right? Now, as well, the evil members can be strong engines for plot advancement because your evil characters are going to pursue their goals more directly than a neutral character would. The neutral characters are just leaves on the wind, right? They're, they're, they're kind of floating through. They, they want things for themselves, and they want the world to continue spinning. Um, they may not be as inclined to follow something. 
Uh, that said, our chaotic neutral character is probably the closest thing to a good character we have in the party. But even then, he's he's just going around and he he wants to be a good guy and he wants other to help other people be good. He likes this region. He wants to keep the pot stirring, um, but he doesn't want it to be you know like bottled or whatever by this invading force. So the evil members, you have the neutral evil one who is an assassin. You know, he's he's sent to kill someone. He, he could buy lollipops for orphans along the way. In fact, he probably will, because that's kind of his personality thing that we, that he has going on. Um, but he wants to pursue it, and he's going to need other people to come along. Our lawful evil character has a goal in mind, and especially he needs people uh, to come along with him, too. So we come over here. We go to Folus here. Not only uh, will he run away if he's outnumbered in a fight... Um, but he wants the, that the lower lifted up and the high and mighty are brought down. He doesn't want anyone else to endure the hardships he's been through. Um, and so he's he is really pursuing these goals, but he needs other people to do it for his own selfish reasons of running away or not wanting to do it directly himself. And, uh, and he's probably been given a mission to kill someone important. And that someone important could even be her father, mother, um, you know, a cousin or something, right? If she comes from a noble family, how do we bond these characters? Well, Rillian here would want to be best buddies forever and, like, buy her meals, maybe even romance her or something. He wants to be best buddies because he's not sent out to kill her. He's sent out to eventually kill her dad or whatever. And so here we have an evil character who will compel the plot forward and who can actually befriend the neutral character. And the neutral character, heck, might even uh, make an attachment back if he's coming across as a rich suitor. And so now we've had this bond together and they'll want to be more cooperative with each other. Uh, Bobica says, your characters are braver than mine would be. <laughs> Bubonic, hey Bubonic, welcome. If one commits a crime and no one did anything to stop them, then they're just as guilty in the eyes of the law. I am the law. Romonger continues, Oh, the plague was called the Plague of Weeping Tears, and no healing magic seemed to work. It seemed to make things worse. Ooh. So that'll be a like a sub-mystery to solve, also, if you can, while you're in that in that area. And uh, it, it's a bit ironic, Bubonic. You pop, uh, you pop up when Romonger's talking about this really horrible disease that makes you bleed out your eyes. <laughs> um, so this is these are the considerations we've had so far for this advanced campaign now something that you want to do as a DM is to allow your, your players to be spotlighted to have their characters have the spotlight shown they get their 5 minutes of fame and things move on throughout the story this keeps the wheels spinning or the, you know, the dishes spinning that kind of a thing uh, that also is a compliment to your players to allow them to step up and continue telling this compelling story. So I would suggest as a consideration for us developing this as a campaign, we want to develop a long-term goal for each to accomplish by the end of the campaign. If we say, okay, we're going uh, five to 15 or six to 16, what is the one thing that they, that they want to do? Uh, generally, this is going to be their bond, right? So let's look at uh, Del uh, Deliaha here. I come from a noble family, and one day I'll reclaim my lands and title from those who stole them from me. That's her goal. That this is, Her bond is her goal. This is what she wants to do over the course of her ten levels, or whatever the campaign is set to do. Let's look at Folus. No one else should have to endure the hardships I've been through. Someone I loved died because of a mistake I made. That will never happen again. That's a strong sense of, de of determination. And this personal determination can help a neutral evil character behave when he needs to behave. You know, when the, the waiter brings him his check for lunch, he actually pays for the meal instead of cutting the guy's throat and, you know, do, def uh, desecrating the, the corpse before leaving. Uh, for uh, Oh, and uh, short-term goals that are usually accomplished over the course of a couple levels. And by a couple levels, I'm using, I use the milestone method for character advancement. I don't do experience points. So a milestone would be completing a dungeon, overcoming an interaction, uh, fighting a tough battle, things along these lines. 
Bubonic says that's a common side effect of many hemological diseases. Are you talking about just bleeding from everywhere, or are you talking about that curative magics only make them worse? <laughs> um, so, the short-term goals that you can help establish to, like, weave in throughout your story, these are things that are usually great to cover the character's flaws or their or to play to their ideals versus whatever's happening in the plot at that point in time. So here's a short-term goal that we want to keep. We want to keep Rillian in line. We don't want him, you know, pushing grandma over the cliff. We don't want him murdering babies and eating kittens and doing evil stuff. Um, an innocent person is in prison for a crime that I committed and I'm okay with that. Can we use this information as a DM to weave into the story and make it relevant? Can we spotlight him for a portion of this of this milestone so that it doesn't become the Rillian show, but Rillian is featured in this episode of the show? And then after that, maybe we work in uh, Deliaha here. Right? I'm always in debt. I spend my ill-gotten gains on a dec on decadent luxuries faster than I bring them in. So, we have the Deliaha episode, and we spotlight her and her pursuit of personal wealth and gain. Bleeding from the eyes and everywhere. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, the uh, bubonic plague isn't just the only thing. Uh, so, I went through the characters, I, I looked at their ideals and their flaws, um, and these are a couple possibilities. These are, these are some short-term goals that we can put out before them, right? If we're using their bond as a long-term goal as a DM, here's some short-term things that we can do to spotlight them and weave them through the overarching story. For Main Chin, gather others to prevent disaster. Advance his studies, right? Because he, he has that ritual book, he has a calligraphy kit. He's out trying to study techniques. He's out trying to study these magical effects in order to uh, become more one in order to become stronger, because that fits his personality. Become strong in the face of exile and his temple. I forget if it was uh, Babacus, or it might have been King. Uh, someone brought up the fact, uh, like we called him an exile, and uh, it might have been uh, Babacus who said, well, maybe someone came to his temple and said, well, your style is weak and it sucks. And he said, all right, you know, step up. And the person stepped up, and our character here defeated him. And not only defeated him, but actually killed him. And his defense to his monastic brothers was, I proved that we were stronger. I don't understand what's wrong. This is exactly what, uh, th this is what I was taught to do. This is our philosophy. And, they, and he was exiled because he killed a man. But instead of feeling that he was wronged, he said, fine, I'm going to go out and I'm going to continue this way and I'm going to study and get stronger and smarter. Maybe not intelligent wise, but I'll get stronger and wiser. <laughs> um, and so you can bait a new ritual in front of this character to be a compelling, uh, a compelling force or to bring them back in if they're getting out of line or to shine a spotlight on them uh, to reward them or to shine a light on them if they're kind of being like a, <laughs> if they're being a roach, right? They're, they're kind of making the place messy. Uh, you shine the flashlight on them to say, hey, attention over here. Folus, gather others who want to change the culture or economics. You know, see, he's almost more of the, uh, yeah, I, he's almost like a, I would almost say like a communist rabble rouser, right? He wants, he, he's looking more for equality among people. He doesn't want anyone to have to suffer. It seems like a very altruistic thing to do, but in order to guarantee these equal outcomes, you're going to have to make these selfish decisions. If no one can be rich, does that make everyone poor? And I, I'm not looking at starting real-life uh, socioeconomic, uh, you know, discussions. We can have those. I'm not afraid of that, and that th all plays into role-playing. But for this character, you know, he started out in the city, he was making money, he had this mentor, the mentor dies, and he seemingly lost everything. And then he went out to the druids, who probably are running a very... Um, it, to probably They're probably living in a commune, in a circle, and he sees their way of life and says, Oh, no, train me. I want to bring this to, you know, the cities, and the cities are these, you know, corrupt uh, organizations. People suffer needlessly, and I'm going to bring it down. So this is giving him his evil flavor um, while trying to uphold morals and values. So he doesn't want to push Grandma over, 
Um, he just wants to make sure that grandma doesn't have an advantage over her grandchildren or her grandchildren over her. So, your name is, uh, yeah, <laughs> your name is one of those where it happens in later stages. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, then we have Deliaha. I need money, let alone enough to pay my debts. She's easy. She's Fujiko from Lupin the Third. You know, she'll give you a wink and a smile, and she'll pick your pocket uh, without necessarily, uh, you know, following through. Maybe she does. I don't know. Um, but money is a big, compelling factor for her. I think she's willing to set aside a lot of things. If, if she's this kind of... We've summarized her as a gold digger. And I imagine if she's doing that, she's uh, not exactly going after Prince Charming all the time. She might be going after people who... Um, are willing to pay for time and attention to keep it PG-13. These people might not often look the best or carry themselves the best way. They may not have the best ethics. Um, so if she's willing to set that stuff aside, and we have characters who have, you know, who are lawful evil, neutral evil characters who have these darker sides to them, these selfish sides, she's willing to set that aside if she's getting paid, right? She's Faye from Cowboy Bebop, uh, if we want to use something else. Another anime reference. Um, She's running away until she's strong enough to return home. So she needs to she needs to become strong. She's just not doing this to, you know, to do it and sow wild oats and never come back. She actually wants to come back, but she can't unless she gets stronger of mind, of body, of of you know, uh, social uh, ranked the ranking on the the ladder. Um, she wants to practice cons of different types in different areas as a way to prove herself. And probably she's doing it to others so that when she assumes her title back at home, she knows when a flim flam man comes in before her uh, during court and wants to, you know, sell her a bridge that doesn't exist. And uh, there's also the fact that this was her... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll go over. It's over here. I keep multiple holy symbols on me and invoke um, whatever deity might come in a useful uh, given moment. So you could always dangle that in front of her too. Hey, here's an, here's a new holy symbol. And in fact, the dungeon we made fits really well into this because this is it's probably an unknown religion at this point in time. But if this is kind of what she does, this could be a compelling factor, let alone any riches or things along those lines. Uh, Bubonic says, although viral is uncurable, it's the bacterial plague that has a higher death rate. 65% survival rate for viral versus 7 to 12 for bacterial. Go figure. Oh, wow. Bobby says that's a selfish way to be high-minded. Is that um, is that what you're talking about for uh, Deliaha, or are you talking about Folus to be uh, a selfish and high-minded, Bobicus? Bubonic says plague that hit Europe was uh, viral. The stuff that hit uh, Louisiana was bacterial. Wait, uh, now so this I don't think I remember that from history class. Did we have a mini Black Plague outbreak in Louisiana? I guess that would make sense, right, if the rats came over on the ship or something. It is a port city, and it is a swamp, <laughs> so I can see that happening. I just don't remember there ever being, like, a Louisiana outbreak of it. Gileov? He's kind of easy to please. He wants to gather money in a crew. He wants to own a boat. He wants everyone to just be free and get along. He wants to allow for maximum personal freedom in the region. Now, this is probably in the philosophy of, look, don't... No killing, raping, pillaging, whatever. I, I want us to be free and happy. I don't want us to be in conflict and killing each other or causing stress. Because it's great economically, it's great socially, it makes for great adventures, you meet new people. And so he's an easy pleaser. Um, he does want money also. He wants a crew, so it's not just about money, but it's it's possibly about getting other people on board. And so each of these characters in this way is looking for a way to influence the other to be a part of their gang. And if they're all playing the long game because they have long goals and you as a DM are establishing that with them as PCs, look, this is the this is the long con. What we, we can even use um, uh, Deliaha's mentality. She plays the long con. Um, this isn't just a, if, if you know, you smite the first person who upsets you. Now, Rillian might have a problem with that. Rillian says, I blow up at the slightest insult, but he can play that off as just saying the wrong thing or clenching his fists and looking visibly angry, which is a tell that someone else might have won in a social situation. It doesn't mean he has to tear the throat out of, out of uh, someone who just looked at him the wrong way. 
So that's why, again, this is advanced for the players, not just the DM. If you're playing this neutral, evil, spy-hired killer, you are not going to get to complete your mission if you commit random murder along the way. I understand you can do it in Grand Theft Auto, and I understand you can do it in Skyrim and all this other stuff. Um, but if we're running... I, I hate necessarily using this word in this way. If you want to run a realistic D&D campaign, you get what I'm saying, right? I know it's an oxymoron. If you want to run a realistic D&D campaign, you can't tear the throat out of a little girl who spilled her ice cream on your shoe. You can be upset and clench your fists and say, uh, and say, uh, you know, really and really and scowls at the little girl and, and emits a uh, emits a growl. And that's role playing exactly to the flaw, or I'm sorry, uh, to the personality trait. That's not even the flaw. Then he could say, uh, you know, he has this moment of zen and he says, no, if I if I blow up here, this is going to jeopardize my mission. That's important. It's important because I believe in charity. I believe I'm doing something. If I tear this tyrant down, this is going to help so many people. Um, or I don't want to make the same mistake that happened before. And so then maybe he just buys a new ice cream cone for the girl. That doesn't make him not evil, but tearing the throat out of the girl doesn't prove that he is evil. Does that make sense? Uh, hopefully, hopefully for you all who are watching here, you're getting this kind of tightrope walk, or as we've said, we're going down an, a bowling alley that has bumpers on it, or we're playing pinball and we have bumpers keeping the character that is the pinball going as long as possible. Uh, uh, Bubonic says, New Orleans got hit when the, uh, it was still French territory. The book movie interview with a vampire. Oh, now that you mention that, okay, that does make sense. Yep. Thank you, Bubonic, for the history lesson, by the way. And also, Ro looks like he's continuing his story, and so also thank you again, Ro, for sharing uh, the, the blurbs of your 12-hour, like, epic marathon that you had today. Um, through the sewers we sneaked and upon the condemned district we arrived the Bates factory was on the far side of the district and on the far side of all the weepers oh okay who are the plague infected most of the weepers didn't even notice we were there uh, a few would attack out of pure anger and fear of certain death okay that makes sense and you know what row two I, I don't know if you're if you're copying this and you're putting it in a word document or something but I would suggest doing so because not only are you typing with energy and all this is still fresh, you're you're creating a campaign chronicle that you can go back and revise and share with others. You can share it on Discord too if you want. Um, but keep it for memories. You know, if you have a scrapbook, write this stuff down. Create a campaign diary. Uh oh, Jam's going into the woods. Is it a deer? It never is. <laughs> it is a or an troll. You need an 11 or greater, get a plus 2 modifier, rolling with disadvantage. Stops on 12 and 13, Jam Jam, into the woods, comes out with a troll head. <laughs> Go back to your bridge, fiend! <laughs> Very good, and you earn that 250 experience points, Jam Jam. There we go. So now we have, uh, oh, so yeah, Gileov was, he's really easy to please here, right? He wants money, he wants a crew, he wants to eventually own a boat, which by the way, wink, wink, what did we provide for at the end of the dungeon, right? We, we said he kind of, we bring him through this dungeon and we built it as DMs in a, using a different methodology and a different set of DM skills. But at the end, we said that this was going to end like a certain movie from the 80s. Well, I guess it didn't necessarily end exactly like that. However, that is the payment. And now that uh, by this point in time, if we're running them through this dungeon, this probably is not their first thing that they're doing. This happened halfway through. Maybe as they're passing by, uh, rumors that this dungeon opened up from the mudslide. And if you want to watch, uh, that should be a video on demand here on Twitch. And it will, if it's not already up on YouTube, it will be up on YouTube uh, shortly after I finish this broadcast. Um, and sure enough, you provide for it here in the campaign. You are a benevolent DM, be, uh, and you give them big rewards like this because they're willing to take big risks. And I just don't mean risks as in combat. I mean risks in role-playing or the intrinsic risk of playing a neutral or an evil, or we have a neutral evil character, that can be very taxing and straining on the player in order to continue to make a compelling character who's fulfilling 
his or her goals while remaining to the character. Now, will their alignments change over the course of the campaign? Probably. As they're generated, if this if this was level 5, which is level 1 in what we're doing, this is what we have to work with. And if we say that we, uh, as DMs, okay, well, they, they should probably get their reward, you know, go through the dungeon, get their reward by level 10 or 11, then we have five levels of story to tell, because we're using the milestones, in order to get them to that point. Um, so, lastly, we have Rillian, who's a bit of the sticky wicket here, um, on the surface. Though, if we think about it, we come over and we see, all right, ideals and flaws tend to be good short-term goals in order to help encourage or cover up for, make up for. Rillian has, a, uh, to, has to fulfill his mission to assassinate a, a certain political leader. Is that leader related to Deliaha? It could be. If he's going to play the long game and wants to kill her father, he will, he will bide his time through ten levels in order to, at the very end, uh, plunge that dagger into his heart. Or after 10 levels of adventuring with her and realizing that she cares for him and that there's more to things that are going on as he's gone on this uh, literal and metaphorical personal journey of growth, you as a DM offer that choice. Rillian, you stand here in the dining hall. You have the opportunity. Uh, he's not paying attention to you. He's talking, uh, you know, he, he's talking to someone else you have every means and motivation to kill her father here and now. She might not even be able to find out it was you. Do you do it? And then your player will hopefully sit back and say, well, that was my mission. Am I willing to defy my order? My boss, my master, my whatever. Or do I yield and say, no, I won't. And this is a character... Like, so the last boss isn't a monster, isn't, you know, uh, the Dread Lord Commander. The last boss is himself. He has a huge moral conundrum to overcome. And he's either going to plunge the knife or he's going to stick the knife back down onto the table where it belongs. And that's your ending, right? That, that is, uh, that's a good character spotlight. That's a good compelling factor. That will keep him as a, uh, as a neutral evil character behaving and kind of bonded to another character until he gets to this point to make a decision. And until then, he could have done neutral evil stuff along the way, right? As long as it's not getting in the way of his mission. He uh, you, Also, uh, he might want to punish wickedness. You know, he's not, he's not uh, the type who is like Batman who doesn't want to kill people or use firearms. If he sees a wicked deed being done, like a poor person being beaten down by someone else or a woman, um, you know, being forced into a situation... He's neutral evil. He will kill the aggressor. And he won't apologize for it. And he'll actually think that he's doing a good thing by murdering someone. He might not have asked questions, right? He's not an investigator. But he saw that this man was trying to force himself on a woman. Or he saw that there was a tax collector, you know, beating someone for uh, the last copper out of his wallet. He might punish wickedness along the way. And so, by uh, as a DM, providing these little micro-encounters where he can make these moral uh, these moral judgments, or uh, I kind of hate putting it this way, but you're almost kind of like allowing the character to bleed off his aggression and to bleed off his murderous intent uh, to keep him sated until the big moment. These are little short-term goals too. And, uh, and that kind of goes into this last point. He helps the needy along the way. You know, is it a beggar? He probably will give a beggar a copper, or a copper or two, I can see that, um, because they haven't done anything wrong. Although, if we set a goal that someone is a tyrant that needs to be brought down, yeah, he's going to be for it. Again, he's going to play the long game. He's this hired killer type of spy. He infiltrates, he murders, and he gets out. He doesn't. He's not there to ask questions. He's there to infiltrate, get a job done, and get out, based on the research other people who are good at that stuff are, have been doing. Uh, Roe continues. Uh, sorry, I missed it here for a minute while I was going on. Uh, Rose continuing, we didn't use firearms because solid snake mode engaged. <laughs> I like how you put that. Uh, so we were using bows and crossbows. Hand-to-hand -hand and melee wasn't an option due to the risk of contact with the plague. Ooh. So I, I like the special battlefield conditions that your DM set here. As we move through the district, we witness the Tarantian army cleansing the district's residents. 
Um, so is this like they're going door to door with a uh, with a flamethrower? Were they like throwing acid on stuff, or um, were they just putting people to uh, a really long sword or something? And also, how did that make your people feel? Because obviously, yeah, you, you feel bad these people are infected, but did did your did your party say, well, they're doomed anyway, and they're being dispatched humanely, or did they take um uh, did they take umbrage that uh, they are dead anyway, but they were actually being toyed with and played with by the soldiers doing the dispatching, or what was was there a moral conundrum set to this uh, romonger? Okay, the last point for us to consider as DMs as we want to conceptualize this story. How do we keep a world of political turmoil alive around our characters? This isn't just a linear, like, haunted house ride, you know, where you get in the car and it takes you room to room and you see the spooky thing and then you go to the next one. There are six countries operating in our theater of war. Seven, if you want to count this external empire threat or, you know, whatever we make this uh, be, like what Bobicus was talking about. So there's, there's technically seven, and it, that's... If we are agents of said seventh, then that for sure. There's things going on that we can't affect there, let alone, you know, us trying to affect the other countries that we are. So I would uh, have us consider, let's make a calendar with several major events happening outside of the character's control. Suggestions. Uh, the invasion moves forward. Maybe we have, like, an invasion tracker. You've probably played games with, with similar things. Uh, Betrayal at House on the Hill has a tracker. Uh, Biohazard has a, has a tracker, things along those lines. And so you just have countdown timers to things. And this will make your world come alive around your players. And sometimes your players will say, well, look, there's nothing that we could have done. We were two countries away, and we didn't even know that this person was being threatened by the time they get the news that, you know, King so-and-so was, uh, was poisoned. Other times, you, you make it, uh, it, it's close to home. And they say, oh, geez, uh, you know, uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop so-and-so, we were just there. Is that something we could have prevented? Like, did we have the clues? And then they, they get a little introspective. Um, so, uh, the invasion moves in, there's a political coup, assassinations. Things are happening among these seven, six to seven countries um, that the players, are, that you're using to add another set of bumpers around. Like, because your players are all bonded to the region in some way. And you want to show that there are things that are happening and these other things could even be clues that they can follow. Are they in the city when the king is poisoned? Maybe maybe they don't even care about the king, but maybe they want the reward because a lot of these characters want money. Hey, there we go. Uh, it just so happens that as, they, as you let them go through the story and pursue the things they're pursuing, they were in the, the city and the country that they needed to be when this event on your calendar happened. Otherwise, maybe they hear about it, you know, a couple weeks, a month later, and, uh, you know, oh, King so-and-so died, and they, they say, oh, wow, that, that really sucks, but, oh, well, we're doing what we're doing, but in the back of their minds, your players are, are thinking, they're subliminally saying, if not consciously, saying, there's a timer, there are consequences, we need to do stuff because tick-tock, tick-tock, the invasion's approaching. Um, we're kind of talking about plagues and diseases in chat right now. Um, th there's uh, there's a plague that's also starting to spread. In fact, that was um, there's a plague or famine not only in Candor, which is Area One, that's spread over into Area Two, and so a plague spread, and that's bad. Famine spread, that's bad. There's an invasion happening, that's bad. These are all things to provide a continual creeping pressure like a, a measuring board against which your characters can take actions. And it makes your world come way more alive. It's more vibrant. And by the way, areas one and two that have this plague, we can even say, uh, like, so if this is the capital over here of Aslandia, what if we say that the uh, Kandor, which is the capital over here, is, um, it's, you know, what if it's built, um, it's built here, Right, so they have the protection from the mountain. They have the, they have the the fresh water and the salt water alike. There's a source of wood. Well, these two aren't necessarily that far from each other, and boats that are leaving here probably travel through the straits. And one of the first things they do, do do do, you know, here, here's the Indiana Jones, right? Or if we're playing a family circus comic, uh, comic, what do they do? They trade here 
before they continue on and make their way around and do to do to do. Hey Clark, welcome back. We're we are we're not even knee deep in plot and in thinking and in these these like higher conceptual levels of world building. Uh, we're we're at least waist deep and oh we're we're trying to throw we have our high waters on, you know, we're we're out there slogging through it. Uh, but yeah, welcome back, Clark. Uh, I did change the music, but I think the music should be at the same volume. So if it's still kind of intense for you, Clark, let me know. And it looks like Peru is still alive somehow. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, Ro was also continuing his story from his 12-hour marathon. We also found non-infected survivors. They informed us that there were two gangs in the district that controlled certain areas that we needed to go through. The survivors requested that we get rid of these gangs. Any gold we find we can keep, but they wanted the food. Ah. Uh, another kind of... So, was that presented also as a moral conundrum to you, Romonger? Like, did you, did you choose to wipe out the gangs? Or did you choose to negotiate with the gangs? Or um, did the gangs say, oh yeah, that's just what actually that third gang would uh, send people out to try and do, but they're actually a gang themselves? Did this just turn into the, the Gangnam Style music video? These questions and more will be answered. <laughs> um, and so the possibilities here, we make a plot calendar by level, right? If we're using milestones. All right, so within the level one area, um, here's a country and this thing's going to happen. Or you could even have, you know, individual little trackers. However complex you want to make this, I guarantee you can find very complex ways of doing this. Keep it simple. Keep it complex. I don't know how you want to do it, but these are the suggestions. These are the considerations. You do plot points by date. So instead of doing it by milestones, um, which offer a little bit more flexibility and, and a floatiness, you just give hard dates. Now, you know that the Duke is going to be assassinated on the road between X and Y on this day. And if the characters are there, the characters can interact with that possibility. If the characters are not there, they learn about it, you know, X days later. And, oh shoot, it looks like we're one step closer to war. Now, was the obligation, uh, was the obligation on them to save the Duke? Probably not, unless you put it on them. But it's showing that there are other forces at work that are advancing the tides of war, that are advancing the tides of discourse, that are advancing politics, um, and that are and that are those are check marks against your players' personalities. I'm sorry, your players' characters' personalities, because this could cause a conversation in a tavern between Rillian. Whoops. Uh, because Rillian might say, oh, Duke so-and-so? Yeah, that guy was a real jerk. He, he deserved to die. And then you have Deliaha says, oh, what a shame. I was actually thinking about going out with him. And then you have um, Gilead who said, what, what are you talking about? This, um, you know, I, we made a personal delivery to this man. He was wealthy and he, and he uh, you know, he kept buying things. Even if it was for himself, or I know he shared some of it, but even if it was for himself, he was a huge economic player and uh, player and you know mover and shaker. If he's dead, that's going to kill this whole part of uh, of an industry. And then you might have Folis about the same incident at around a tavern table say, "No, th this is the natural order of things. Things die, and this happens. And you know what? I hope that his assets get uh, returned back to his people and not just fall to someone else." And then you have Mainshin, who probably doesn't uh, really care about that. He's he's still brooding over, guys, who cares about a duke? There's this invasion happening. In fact, what if this is a symptom of that invasion? What if the uh, what if this outside, um, I think we called it uh, Chandelar, or, or it might have been Shadahar. Uh, what if this Shadahar Empire sent an agent to kill the duke? We should investigate this. Now, he's providing a compelling reason to do something, and Deliaha might say, oh, there's a lot of money, you say, from either <laughs> either Mainshin or Folis's, uh, or Folis or uh, Giliav's uh, description. And so she might want to go too, and, and so you, you've made this open world area that doesn't succumb to open world video games where you need to climb towers or do all this other stuff that's kind of become a trope itself. It's a living, breathing world. 
and your your PCs might not mind, uh, or your players, let alone their PCs, might not mind if they're not making. You know, every day is is measurable. You know, one mile towards completing our ultimate goal, as long as things are still happening and they're making um, advancements. <laughs> the Gucci Gang. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get up. It's been about another hour, so I'm going to get up and I'm going to finish off my tea and I'm going to take a stretch. Uh, you know, you all do the same. Row, hey man, keep pounding out that story. I'm, I'm digging it and I'm following along. And uh, we'll come back and we can talk about specifics. If, if, if this setup has given you ideas, sure, let's make an outline for something. Uh, we can do that together. Do you want to talk about, uh, like, do we all kind of want to crowd around uh, Unky Rose uh, uh, rocking chair in front of the fire and listen to tell, stale, uh, tell tales? Hey, I'd love to do that, too. Uh, this is a mutual conversation back and forth. All right, anyway, here's a short rest. I'll be back soon. <laughs>